In this video, I want to show you how I make all of my plots and graphs as a math professor and as a math YouTuber. Specifically, I'm going to show you how to make plots using LaTeX and a specific package, PGF Plots. If you have no idea what LaTeX is, that's totally fine. Go down in the description. I have an entire playlist introducing you to all the big ideas about LaTeX. But big picture, LaTeX is a typesetting language to make beautiful math documents. And I'm going to show you the plots and graphs portions of it in this video. For myself, I use a lot of different software. Sometimes I use MATLAB, sometimes I use GeoGebra, but the most common one is to use LaTeX. And that's because as a mathematician, as in many other fields in STEM, I'm sort of LaTeX native. All of my documents are going to be made in LaTeX. So going that extra step to learn how to make your plots in LaTeX is very natural because the syntax of the code is really natural with the code that you already know. You have complete control over every aspect of the plots. And indeed, if you change something in your document, some other part of your document, it's going to affect how you display your graphs as well. So everything's going to look really consistent. LaTeX free, it's going to be available everywhere for a really long time. So I just really like using LaTeX. Okay, final thing before I jump into it is that if you're going to use LaTeX, then you need a LaTeX editor. And the one I have been recommending for years, my favorite one, and indeed the sponsor of today's video is Overleaf. Overleaf is a cloud-based LaTeX editor, so you don't have to install anything. It's just sort of easy and ready to go. And it's just incredibly powerful because it adds on top of your standard LaTeX editor a ton of just nice quality of life features like having an entire document history and tracking changes and collaborating and syncing with GitHub and any number of things that are just all really easy to do in Overleaf. Regardless, there's a tracking link down in the description, so if you click that, then they will know that I sent you and everybody's going to be happy. All right, let's finally get into the video. I'm going to come here and make a new project. I'm going to make a blank project and I'm going to call it uh, PGF Plots YouTube. So this is what I get with Overleaf, a little bit of code on the left and then it outputs on the right. I'm going to clean this up by getting rid of my title. And now what I want to do is add the package into LaTeX that will allow me to make my plots. And so I'm going to go backslash use package and the package that I'm going to use is PGF plots. This package is going to give me all the new functionality that I'm going to want for making plots. So then I come down below into my section, which maybe I will call first 2D plots because that's where I'm going to begin. And let's make our first plot. To actually make a plot, I need to go backslash begin and then I need to write Tixie picture. Tixie is actually the subject of my previous video, which allowed me to do a lot of different graphics, but I'm going to focus specifically on using plots. And nevertheless, PGF plots is built out of Tixie, and that's why the thing that I'm creating is going to be a Tixie picture, sort of like we've seen before. One quick feature of Overleaf here is that as you can see, it's uh, brought down this begin Tixie picture dot dot dot. If I just hit enter, it just quickly goes and has the end Tixie picture as well. Just makes my life a little bit easier. Because I'm doing plots, I want my plots to have like an X and a Y axis. So I'm going to do similarly a begin axis. It pops down again, so I hit enter and I've got a begin axis and an end axis. So I almost always have those four lines anytime I make a Tixie picture. Next up, I want to add a plot, so I'm going to go backslash add plot, <laughs> very original here. And let's do a plot of, oh, I don't know, how about just x squared? I'm going to put a semicolon, and now I come up here to click the compile button, and it's going to give me out this plot. There it is. My section is called 2D plots, and I have this nice x squared. One quick note, now that I've hit compile, Overleaf has come here and it's put up this little warning. It's noting that this is currently a backwards compatible version. And what I really should do is just add a little thing that sets the particular version at the 1.18. So I'll follow its advice. I'll write backslash PGF plots set. And I'll write compat is equal to 1.18 to give me the most recent version. I don't think this actually is going to affect anything we do in this video, but I can also use this section in the preamble to specify other properties that I might like to do. And so I'm also going to do, well, I'm up here, width equals 10 centimeters. And this is just going to make that my plot is going to have a width of 10 centimeters. As you can see, it's, its size has slightly changed. In the preamble, you're always putting these sort of global properties that are going to affect the entirety of your document. And then I can make my individual plots down below. Now, I like this plot, but I want to show you how I can customize it. 
So if I go back to where I was with add plot, I can put in square brackets a range of parameters. So right now I have this in blue. Let's say that I wanted it to be color equal to red. I'm also, now that I'm putting in the square brackets, I'm getting rid of the dots that used to appear here because that was sort of the default setting. And now all settings that I want to list have to go inside of these square brackets. What else can I put in here? Maybe I could type dash to make them dash. Maybe I want to have uh, uh, circles again. So maybe I'll go mark equals say asterisk. That'll give those little spots all the way along. Let's take a look at what that looks like. This gives me something that looks like this. One other thing I want to show you that I will often put in here is basically the way this is plotted is it looks at all of these points, the ones that I've indicated, which is just a default number of dots, and it draws straight lines between them. And I can control this by going samples equals, uh, let's do something like just five, which is going to plot it as only having five dots. And you can see that it basically creates these straight lines between them, which is really bad. So if you ever find that you've got any sharpness to your curves, just add a larger number. Let's go to say 50. It'll take a longer time to compile, but it looks like a smoother graph. So even if you don't want these dots displayed, well, it's still often nice to have a large number of controls that have a very smooth graph. Let's add one more. I'll go backslash add plot. I'll put it in square brackets properties. Let's do color equal to blue. And this function, how about one minus x squared? Okay, let's go and plot that. Now, this is fine, but I don't really like what my axes are doing. So it's defaulted to this minus six to six. It looks like sort of maybe minus 30 up to 30, but I never told that anywhere. That was just it deciding what it wanted to do if I didn't give any specification. So in the same way that I use square brackets to modify the properties of the specific function that I'm plotting, I can go up to here, it says begin axis, and I can put in square brackets properties of the axes. So for example, one thing I might like to do is set the minimum and maximum bounds for X and Y. So I'm going to do X min is, oh, I don't know, how about this? Minus two, X max equal to two, Y min equal to uh, minus two, and Y max equal to plus two. Plot that, and now these bounds are going to change. So, okay, we have this. I'm noticing that my blue curve looks jagged again. We know how to fix this. I have to set my samples to a larger number. Let's do 50. And hopefully this is going to make it look a little bit nicer. And it does. You can still see a little bit of jaggedness. So if I wanted to get rid of that, I can make it a hundred. And if you really wanted to and have a long compile time, you can make it a thousand or something like this. So anyways, we have this nice smooth curve. Other things that I can do, and I'll, I'll leave them in my uh, square brackets associated with the begin axis. Well, okay. I don't really like that I have this square box around it. Somehow I just like to have two lines for my axis. So I'm going to write axis lines equals left. This has created an error here. And oh, I know what it is. I didn't actually put a comma between them. I really like, by the way, the way that Overleaf deals with all the errors because you're going to make them. Regardless, now that I've got axis lines go to left, I just have these two over here, which is totally fine. Another property you might often like here is writing middle. It's, you'll notice that zero and zero is in the, in the middle of this which is not always how people want to have it. So if I write it in the middle, this maybe looks like the most standard way so that the spot it crosses is right at the orange. So, so your choice, there's many different options here. The next thing I'm going to do is add some labels. I'll write X label equals just X and I'll make Y label equal to Y and this will hopefully give me some nice labels on my chart. And just in case you didn't know that this was the X and the Y axis, there you go. Last thing I will do is make a title. I'll put this in squiggly brackets. How about like and uh, subscribe? There you have a call to action put into my video uh, and it's going to give a nice title up at the top. There's a lot more manipulations you can do, but this is the basic idea. The last thing I'm going to do on this plot is, okay, so I've specified the bounds of my plot to be from minus two and minus two, but maybe I don't want to display the entire plot this way. So what I'm going to do is let's go to say the x squared one here, samples 50. I'm going to add one more line to this. The line that I'm going to add here is the domain equals, and I'm not going to go from minus two to two. I'm going to go minus one colon one. And just for this plot, just for the x squared, it's going to show a limited region where it is plotted, just the smaller domain. So you can specify your domain separately for each individual plot as opposed to the entire graph. Now that we've got the basics, I'm going to speed up just a little bit. So I'm going to copy and paste some code for another plot that I've already done 
and we're going to compare the differences between them. So this is a plot where I've got sine of x and cosine of x, and I've changed a number of things. So let's go through the code one by one. At the very start of it, I have clip equal to false. Okay, this is no big deal. Basically, the idea is if you think about the domain of the box, if you ever any text that would go outside of that, it normally gets clipped off. Like this cosine of x actually reaches beyond the exterior edges of the graph. Clip equal to false means just don't cut that off. Then I specified the bounds on x and y. Previously, that's the exact same. I've set the axis lines to be in the middle. That's the exact same. Now, because this is a graph of cosine and sine, it's more natural for it to have things like pi over two and pi as tick marks along the x-axis, then it is the default, like we've seen previously, like 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and so forth. So you have to manually tell where do the tick marks go and what label do you put at all of these tick marks. So we have two different things. I say the x tick, so these are the tick marks along the x-axis, and they occur at 0, pi over 2, pi, 3, pi over 2, and 2 pi. But then, I need to also say, put the label up, which is the pi over two and so forth. So that's what I do next. X ticks labels. I have to have the same number of labels as tick marks, but now I go and put them. So for example, this code here with the fraction pi divided by two, as we've seen in our previous videos, that's how we would, we would display this, this pi divided by two in LaTeX. I didn't bother it for Y because I was fine for the auto-generated ones for Y. The next thing you'll notice, I have x text label style <laughs> equals anchor southwest. It, it's sort of a mouthful here. So, okay, what is going on here? If I look down at these different symbols, you'll notice that the pi over two is like a little bit above and to the right of the exact location on the x-axis. Same for the pi, a little above and to the right. This is the trick that allows me to have that consistent placement of these tick labels. Basically, you think that the anchor, which is the actual point, is to the southwest, which means the label is to the northeast of wherever the anchor point is going to be. So I like doing this, and, and this notation, if it seems weird, it's exactly the type of notation we did when we were looking at Tixie and nodes in Tixie, as we saw in the previous video. Okay, a few other things that are cool about this graph. I have these dashed vertical lines, so I did X major grids is equal to 2 with the grid style being dashed. I could play around with those. I could add Y ones as well. I could have them being solid lines, whatever I so wished here, but that's where I'm adding a grid system. So all of that is just specifying what I want my axis to be. And it's here, I think that the power of using LaTeX, but also the burden of using LaTeX is maybe going to come clear. I can control everything, but I have a lot of things I have to know and I have to specify every little detail about this. You know, I can't right click on this and change its style. I have to remember grid style equals dashed and so forth. So, so there is a learning curve, but it gives me the benefit of the precise control. Okay, so then I have my two different curves. So I have an add plot, which is gonna be the sine of X and I have the add plot, which is gonna be the cosine of X. In here, in their characteristics between those square brackets, I give a domain exactly like I've done before, zero to two pi. Notice that the range of the plot went to 2.5 pi. That's just to have this arrow go like a little bit beyond. So I often like to have the plot uh, boundaries being a little bit larger than the domain. That's what I've done in this particular case. Sine and cosine is sort of annoying to me as a calculus teacher. The inputs are always supposed to be radians, but PGF plots uses degrees, kind of annoying. So instead of writing sine of x, I write sine of degree of x. That's just to, to force it into the way I think about it, but nevertheless. Then the final thing that I've done on this graph that's new is I put these labels f of x is cosine of x and f of x is equal to sine of x. I probably should not have them both be f of x. I'm going to change the second one to a g. So in the way that I add these blocks of text is just like I would with a Tixie picture. I'm going to write a node. And basically I have a node and I tell you where to put it and then I say what is in the node. So the node occurs and inside of the square brackets is the where I'm putting it. I'm putting it to the right of the position 0 0.9 means it's 90% of the way along the graph. So this was the f of x, the blue. So you see how the f of x, the start of it, is like 90% of the way along to 2 pi. That's what position equal to 0 0.9 is going to do. It's going to plot it over there. If I came and did, say, 30%, then it's going to be, you know, somewhere up over here. Let's see what happens when it compiles. Yeah, right over there. And then in the square brackets, I put whatever the thing I want to be displayed is. f of x is sine of x. 
This is another reason why I really like using LaTeX. If I was going into some other software here and then I wanted to put in that, that stylistic mathematics, well, that software might not have that native or it might display it in a different way with a different font, a different color. And this way, when it's in my LaTeX document, this is just formatted the exact same way it would be anywhere else in my document. Likewise, for the blue plot, I've also added a node to the right after 100% of the way along. That's gonna give me my cosine. All right, moving right along to the third graph here. I'm gonna copy and paste it. This plot is going to be a scatter plot that imports some external data. You'll see down in the code here, I have something about a test.txt. We're gonna to have to see how that's gonna work. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this left button over here, which gives me my project menu inside of Overleaf. Then I'm gonna click a new file here. Let's call this the test.txt to see whether it works. And I'm gonna create it. I could also upload a file or link into any number of places, but right now I'm gonna create a test.txt. It's in this larger folder here. I'm going to copy and paste a large set of data. The data doesn't matter, but the point is I have various columns here. At the top, I have one called GPA and then M-A-V-E-C-O-U-N, doesn't matter the context. This is some data. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to main.txt, which is where it is, and I can click this button to close it since I don't need that any longer. And here I have this uh, command. Let's go and compile it and see what it's gonna do. Okay, so scroll down. Here is our beautiful scatter plot. Okay, let's walk through the code one by one. Okay, so begin Tixi picture, end Tixi picture, we always have that. Begin axis, end axis, we always have that. Then what I'm doing is adding the plot. So this is where all the work is gonna be. So when I do add plot plus, by the way, the plus means I'm gonna use the default formatting, whatever this would naturally do, and then I will add extra stuff on top of the default in times inside of the square brackets, as opposed to the only properties being the ones inside of the square bracket, that's the difference. So what am I putting inside of my square bracket? So the first thing is I write only marks. So marks are all of these dots as we saw before. Only marks mean there's no lines connecting them. So I'm not gonna have some crazy wiggle here. It's just the dots. Next, it's a scatter plot and scatter plot is gonna tell PGF plots to apply some particular color map to all of these points. And it has done the default one. Blue along the bottom, increasing, increasing, all the way up to red along the top. And I like the visual here because it immediately lets me see what the outlier is because it's just sort of right down here in this completely different color. I've also made the mark size just a little bit larger. Next up is the important part. The thing I am adding here is a table and the formatting here is meta equals ma. So what the heck is that? Okay, if I go back to that test uh, text. I have a first column that is automatically, that first column is automatically going to be the x-axis. So saying meta equals ma is saying that the y-axis is going to be the second column from my data. Let's go back. So that's what I'm doing. I'm saying I want my y-axis to be my second column here. And then I call in the squiggly brackets, the actual file. And this is what is giving me my nice scatter plot. You could actually manually type in the coordinates as opposed to table, you could use coordinates here and, uh, and get the scatter plot. But I really like taking your data in an external file to not mess up your main tech document. It's also often formatted that way if you're getting something out of Excel or wherever you might get it. You, know, you can easily bring that directly into uh, LaTeX in this way. The next plot that I'm going to show you, let me compile this is sort of of the same idea. So uh, let's just be clear, this is once, it's just one plot here, it's an add plot here, and it's a scatter plot with only marks, sort of similar to what we've done before. But the reason why I wanna show you this one is I want to show you how to color code different parts of your data. So I have a portion in blue squares, a portion in white circles, and a portion in red triangles. So, so really that's the little trick here. So. The way I do this is that, oh, here's a great example of me listing the coordinates. I was talking about not putting them from an external file previously. This is how I would do this. I just list all of the coordinates, pretty much equivalent. But at all of the different points that I have, I also put on the right-hand side, A, C, A, A, B, C, B, and so forth. This example, by the way, comes from the official PGF plots documentation. I'll put a link down in the description if you want to have the entire uh, sort of documentation on every possible feature to do with PGF plots. But I'm just trying to show the, uh, the, the best examples to show you. So, okay, so how are the A, the Bs, and the Cs used? Well, 
up in begin access, I've added this thing that says scatter classes, and then I specify in the, for the A, the marks are gonna be squares that are blue, for the B, the marks are triangles that are red, and so forth. The final thing besides specifying the, the sort of the three different classes for my scatter plot is I actually need to turn it on to read that final column with the A, the B's, and the C's. And so I do that with the scatter screener is equal to explicit symbolic. That tells me there's a symbol there that it's going to go and look towards. All right, moving right along here. The next plot that I'm going to do is one that is a stacked bar plot. So let's take a look at that. It looks like this, uh, very nice. And uh, how am I gonna be able to do this? It's, it's pretty simple actually. In the begin axis, I have to just tell you the type of thing that we're doing here. So I'm gonna say this is a Y bar, so, so going up vertically, and it's a stacked one. And then basically the three plots I'm gonna do, I've, I've set it to be this, the default color. So it's gonna go the blue, then the red, and then this brownie color. And I'm gonna add the plots of what the bottom value of the stacks are gonna be, then the middle values and the top values. So, the first coordinate is the x, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then the second coordinate is going to tell me what the height is. So for this first add plot, I'm telling you the heights of the blue. Goes up 1, goes up 1, goes up 3, goes up 2, goes up 1.5. 1, 1, 3, 2, 1.5. Then the second one is going to be a new color. In this case, it's going to be the red one. It has different sets of heights, so you can see how it gets stacked on top. And then the third one with yet new heights again. Now we're about to jump to 3D plots, but I wanted to show you one nice feature of Overleaf that I particularly like, which is the history option. If I come up here to the history button, you can see that I have the versions of this going. Right now it's 425 and I started recording this video at 349, which tells you some of the pauses I had to take as we go along. And if I want, I can just thumb my way through previous versions, and this is really great if you've made a big change and you think, oh shoot, I've, uh, I've accidentally <laughs> deleted something incredibly important, you can come back to that history tab and just see everything that you've done before. It's a really nice feature. Now I want to go to uh, 3D plots, and we'll have this sort of a whole new section of, on 3D plots here, so I'll, I'll start a new section here. And, and let's actually go right from the beginning, just to make sure we remember how we're doing all the things. So, I'm going to go begin Tixie picture. It auto completes for me. Thank you, Overleaf. Then I'm going to begin an axis. It's going to auto complete for me. Thank you, uh, Overleaf, one more time. If I want to do a three dimensional plot, I go backslash add plot as I normally would, but it's now add plot three. I'm going to put the square brackets, which we'll come to later. And now maybe I'll do something like this one minus x squared minus y squared. This is a height z, if you will, above the xy plane. Let's uh, put the semicolon on so we don't get an error when we, can click, when we uh, click compile, and let's see what we get. Well, uh, it is indeed something three-dimensional, but uh, perhaps it best illustrates why I should never use no settings inside of here. So, so let me clean it up, and there's two major ways that I'm going to do it. The first one I'm going to do is I'm going to do surf, and, and let's just do surf just all by itself. So surf is for surface here, and it is, okay, that's a little bit nicer. It is basically going to create a whole bunch of little squares in the domain, and then above those squares, it creates this nice little patch that form together towards a surface. Each patch on the surface is one color. A color gradient is applied to it by default according to its height, and we have this nice little shape. I can do the same thing with samples. Like if I do, oh, I don't know, let's just do five to make it really coarse here. If I do this, then my plot is going to compile really quickly, but as you can see, it just looks really, really poor. If I go to samples equal to 50, it's going to look a little bit nicer. And, and so now it takes longer to compile, but nevertheless, it, it makes this sort of, uh, you know, with a large amount of, of gridding here. The other thing I could do is go back down to something sort of more reasonable, like maybe just 20. I'm going to write shader, and currently it's specified to something called faceted, which is what shows these little gray lines everywhere. But I'm going to change its shader to interp, which I believe stands for interpolation, and it's going to get rid of the grid lines and sort of make this nice smooth gradient effect on the surface. So it's entirely up to you whether you want this or whether you don't want it. So this is all using surf. Uh, another one you can do, I'm going to get rid of the shader as it doesn't apply in this context. Instead of surf, I'm going to write mesh. I really like mesh as well. Mesh doesn't fill in, it just displays the grid line. It's sort of the opposite of what we were just talking about. 
So that can be a, a fun one to have as well. I actually like this one when it's got a higher number of samples. I, I think it kind of uh, has a cool little texture to it. Next thing I could do is come back up to the begin axis and put things inside of the square brackets that I want to specify here. Most of this is just exactly like what we've seen above. If I wanted to change the defaults for uh, what the range is for my plot's going to be, if I wanted to change what the tick marks are going to be, where the axes appear, all of that's the exact same. Let's do something new. Let's do color map. Color map is referring to this choice of going from blue to red. There's a default color map there. I'm going to use a different one, which is the cool one for sort of like cooler temperatures. So let's see what that looks like. Oh, I, uh, it gave me an error because I did the wrong type of slash because I'm an idiot. And we get this nice kind of blue to purpley one. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you like it, maybe you don't. If you don't want axes at all, you can write hide axis and uh, that will get rid of that. All right, final one that I'm going to do for you today. You have been incredibly patient, very much appreciate that. So I put in my final Tixie picture here. This plot is for the other way that you might want to represent something in three dimensions, not as a surface above the XY plane, but with a single parameter input and then an X, Y, and Z output. It creates a sort of helix like this. You see these types of things in my multivariable course all the time. So how am I doing this? Most of the thing is exactly the same. Tixie picture, begin access, that's all the same. Then I've added a plot three, same as before, but I've done something somewhat special to it. But notice what the thing I'm displaying of. It goes inside of round brackets and it has not one, but three different things. So it gets pressed and, and interpreted not as a Z as a function of X and Y, but as an X, a Y, and a Z as a function of some parameter. So I put in the first one and I put it in squiggly brackets, a sine, cosine, and X. That's what's gonna make my helix. And then I have to do one other trick that I put inside of the square bracket for my plot. It's the samples Y equal to zero. This is done just so that the first and the last point doesn't get connected by a line. But Regardless, this is going to create this nice little spiral. Other than that, I haven't done anything other than specify the samples and specify the domain. Oh, I did one other little final trick. One further thing that I can do inside of the square brackets. If you imagine a three-dimensional thing and I'm looking at it, I can look down at it from different angles, specifically a different polar angle and a different azimuthal angle. So that's what I've done here. When I go in the square brackets for my axis and say view 60, 30, this is telling me the angle at which I like to look at it. If I were to delete that in compile, you can see that it rotates the shape just a little bit. So you, you might have cause to decide to change what your viewpoint is. You can change it right there. All right, that brings us to the end of the examples I'm gonna do in this specific video, but there is so much more functionality that I didn't have time to squeeze in. So basically you could look at the full documentation, which I put down in the description, but I actually sort of encourage you don't. I just think that this should be enough to get you started. And then when you want to do something specific, then you go and look it up how you change a specific thing. And probably you can, because you can change just about every possible aspect to do with the display of your graphs using PGF plots. It's an incredibly powerful package. Final plugs is once again, a massive thank you to Overleaf. That has been the LaTeX editor that I am using to do all this document. They supported me with a number of videos on this channel here, which I very much appreciate. You can check out my previous videos with them down below. And we've got one more coming up in a couple weeks on how to use Beamer to make presentations using LaTeX. So <laughs> with all that said and done, give it a video a like for the YouTube algorithm. If you have questions, do leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.